Hello and welcome Ardmore friends and neighbors. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us today, Thursday, April 15th. Um, and maybe you're watching this later on after it actually airs, but we're so glad that um, you guys are joining us for what we believe is a really important conversation and education opportunity. And we get to know more friends um, and getting to um, continue to build the kingdom of God. So thank y'all for joining us. We have special guests with us today. Um, we have Ellen Seacrest, who is with us. Um, she works for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship um, in the Atlanta, Georgia office. Um, and she helps direct the Encourage Your Church program, which is um, the program that we're gonna be talking about quite a bit today. Um, and then we also have with us Janae and Hari, um, and we're so glad that they have joined us. This is, there is a six hour time difference um, between our time zone and where they are in Antwerp, Belgium. And so we're glad that we were able to work this out um, to be able to have you guys here uh, with us. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, and just a side note, they have two beautiful, wonderful daughters um, who are in the house with them. They are actually um, in lockdown in Belgium right now. And so um, you may actually get to hear uh, their daughter's voices, or you may see them running through the background. Um, I was just telling them that as we have um, done things on Zoom for the past year. Sometimes kid interruptions are the moments where we see some of the most beautiful things. Um, so if you see them, um, they are Phoebe and Maria Grace. Um, so you can know their faces as well. But thank y'all so much for being with us. Um, we're gonna get started uh, with Ellen actually and talking about this thing called Encourager Church. So Ellen, can you kind of give us a brief uh, overview of just what is Encourage Your Church? All right. Well, I was so glad to be with each of you today. And uh, having been to Ardmore on several occasions uh, myself, it's always a great pleasure to connect back to, to Ardmore as well. So the Encourage Your Church ministry is a wonderful opportunity for the church to partner with one of the field personnel around the world. Some choose um, I mean, uh, local uh, field personnel within the United States and some want to go global. And so CBF offers both through that. The Encourager Church Ministry is a way uh, that that partnership is strengthened through one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, you as the Ardmore Baptists will be able to get to know the work of Hari and Janae um, and the heart of that ministry that they offer there in Belgium. You'll begin to understand why they're there, what they do, who their friends are, who their church family is, and the importance of that ministry opportunity. And not only will you understand, but you'll find ways to connect. Um, Janae will help you understand ways that um, are appropriate, uh, missions that are not toxic, and ways for you to partner in with them, both um, in person, as well as remote, as well as financial, and of course, um, through their prayer ministry. So our field personnel are very fortunate to have the Encourage Church ministry is an opportunity to deepen relationships with our congregations, and our congregations are fortunate to have field personnel um, in which to do that. Yeah, and why, why is this type of program important or this type of relationship? For me, I think this, um, this program and ministry is, is very important. It's vital. Um, with Janae particularly being there in Belgium with no other field personnel right nearby or CBF office being right nearby, it gives her an opportunity to be able to resource other people. Um, it's, it's also a piece of that Christian friendship um, and, and part of the understanding process. We all of our congregations are about missions, but it helps us understand what it is to be on the mission field um, and to minister in such different ways and, and through different capacities. And so it's a really important piece of ministry um, for our congregations to be involved in. Our congregations are, are really suited well for um, partnering. And so it really helps our field personnel to feel um, supported, to feel friendship, um, to, to feel understood. Absolutely. So how would you say that churches and field personnel benefit from entering into a covenant together? 
Well, the covenant is a formal representation of that relationship. We have many, many, many partners for our field personnel, but the Encourager Church Covenant solidifies that relationship and puts some a little more responsibility on the congregation um, and, and formalizes that so that there is that um, working relationship. Um, and a partner, it's it's sometimes easy to just to give the money. Um, some are our hands on, but with a covenant relationship, um, it's more of that promissory that we're going to be fully invested in your ministry and with you. And um, it, it holds some obligation um, to that. And then a covenant is two-sided. Janae will also be able to, to help Ardmore um, understand your community a little bit better, finding opportunities uh, for international work, um, helping understand different religious um, groups and that type of thing. So it's a reciprocal relationship. It's not just about Ardmore being the giver and Janae being the receiver, but it's a reciprocal relationship um, like all relationships should be. Absolutely. And I know, honestly, that was the... Um, motivating factor for us entering into this type of relationship was hearing that two-way street, you know, that it, it wasn't a giver and a receiver, that it was actually, we're going to get to be in relationship um, with Janae and Hari and just that excitement um, of a reciprocity. Um, one of our team members actually um, asked this question, and I told them that I would ask you, Ellen, um, it, it is... Um, you know, you guys have the offering for global missions, and then we also have this covenant where, you know, we're agreeing as a church to kind of give specifically to um, Janae and the ministries that they do in Belgium. Could you kind of talk about the difference in those two givings, the offering for global missions, and then what we're kind of committing to give to Janae? Sure. So giving to CBF is, is very important. Um, and there's really a threefold give into CBF because by giving to CBF, your church um, helps for to create sustainability of these mission opportunities. It creates uh, positions for people like me to be able to engage into deeper relationships with our congregations. Um, with about a thousand congregations, it takes a lot of work um, for our global staff. And um, I, I will say that the global staff is not huge. There are years that it used to be a really large, large office space. Um, and now it's significantly less. And so my concentration being on church engagement um, helps make a lot of initial contacts with churches and um, that type of thing. So when you give to CBF, you're giving for the broader piece. And then when you give for the offering for global missions, you're giving for field presence. You're helping Janae be able to be on the field as well as the other 62 of our field personnel that are currently serving. Um, it pays for their presence there, which means it helps <clears throat> them to be there um, for their health insurance. It helps them be there for their housing, um, for their salary stipends and those types of things. And then um, without that, Janae wouldn't be able to be on the field um, either. And so then the Encourage a Church program is kind of what I like to call that grandpa, grandpa, uh, grandpa, grandma money. Um, it's the extra that you're giving um, because you value that relationship, because you value the work that's happening. Um, and that money goes to Janae's ministries. Um, all Janae creates a ministry budget every year, and um, your Encourage Your Church gifts help her to fulfill her, her calling um, and the work that Hari does with her um, to, to be able to be in Belgium and to be our representatives um, and to be, as the phrase that we all often use, the hands and feet of Christ for us. We can't all be in Belgium. We can't all be in Uganda, um, but we can all be a part of that work, and the Encourage a Church ministry helps us do that. So giving is kind of a threefold thing, giving to CBF, giving for our offering for global missions, and in your case, also giving for the Encourage a Church ministry. Absolutely. What advice would you give, Ellen, to a church um, or field personnel entering into this type of relationship? I know for us, this is a, our first time doing Encourager Church. Um, Janae already has a, a couple, I think, of Encourager Church um, partners, but what advice would you give to a church entering into this process? I would definitely say uh, do it. My email phone number. Everything is always listed on the uh, on the CBF website. It really is a great relationship. Um, and having grown up in churches, like most of the people in your church, Amy, um, love the idea of the missionary we call field personnel. Um, but to have your own field personnel or missionary to connect with really helps the congregation understand so much more what 
what missions is about. Um, not just being hands on, but through the prayer support, through the financial support, but understanding um, that it's not just popping over to do a, a vacation Bible school here or there, but it's really the long term presence. Um, Janae has been in Belgium for years and years and has created a culture of trust. Um, and uh, created a culture of partnerships um, that she and Hari have worked very, very hard to do. And for the church to be able to walk into that relationship uh, is really a beautiful thing. Um, you know, Christ surrounded himself by disciples. Um, he went with people everywhere. And being an encourager church is similar in that role in that you're walking alongside. You're not recreating ministries, but you're, you're walking alongside of Janae and other field personnel who are doing it so beautifully. And so the Encourager Church ministries are really plus for the congregation. What we have um, continued to see is that for churches who have invested in this ministry, um, it, it not only um, affects this particular role, but it affects all their missions. It helps people get a better understanding of why we do what we do. Um, and basically, it gives us more opportunities to share the love of Christ with, with all people. And um, and having this relationship with Janae is a really great opportunity for Ardmore to um, continue to strengthen the many, many wonderful things that Ardmore already does, but it gives you that one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody. Um, and it, it strengthens the relationship that you'll have with Hari and Janae, but it also strengthens the relationship with the mission community there at Ardmore and in Winston-Salem. Yeah. <clears throat> so now, you know, I'm sure um, you're wondering how it is that we went from this Encourager Church covenant or this Encourager Church program and this model to finding Janae and Hari. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's been a, over a year process. We started talking about this in January of 2020, and here we are in April of 2021. Um, so at first, we just listened and we looked into this program and we bugged the mess out of Ellen <laughs> with a thousand questions. Um, <clears throat> we took it to God as a missions team and as a staff, a, a pastoral staff, and we prayed and we discerned and we looked at the questions of, you know, what are Ardmore Baptist Church's mission priorities? What are our goals? And so we spent a lot of time discerning the answers to those questions and where it was that we felt God leading us. Um, and it was through that process that we uh, whittled and whittled and whittled, and we firmly landed on Janae and Hari and the work that they are doing in Belgium. And I'm not going to tell you about the work that they're doing because it's best to hear it from them. Um, but Janae, Hari, we're so glad that you um, are with us. Um, and we are so glad to be entering into this partnership with you um, and excited about this relationship. So um, Hari, I'm going to start with you. And um, for those of you watching, Janae, you may hear Janae translating a little bit. Hari does speak some English, um, but I think they mostly speak French um, with uh, each other. Um, so if you hear some translation, then you will know exactly why. Um, but we're going to start with Hari so that Janae doesn't have to translate the entire time. Um, so Hari, um, would you be able to uh, talk to us about your background? where you're from, and how it is that you ended up in Belgium. Oui, je venais de Belgique, mon, mon passé. Euh, moi, je, je viens de Séville. I'm from Syria. Euh, J'ai maintenant euh, 45 ans. I am 45 years old now. Euh, J'ai maintenant presque 23 ans en Belgique. And I am about 23. 21 years in Belgium. <laughs> <I couldn't> <laughs> 21, 21. Quand, quand Jésus. I met Jesus when I was 23 years old. Et je connais, uh, Jésus en, en, en Lebanon. And I met him in Lebanon. Et, uh, et venu comme ici en and I came here to Belgium as a refugee 21 years ago. Et vraiment difficile pour 10 ans sans papier. And I lived here in Belgium 10 years without any kind of proper paperwork. It wasn't easy and it took 10 years to get proper paperwork in Belgium. 
But I felt the whole time that the hand of God was with me. Uh, from the moment I met Jesus, I stayed with him and I evangelized wherever I went and I just continued with him. Um, I came from a Catholic background in Syria. Ma famille, qu'elles sont pas euh, croyants, croyants, mais entre parenthèses, deux fois par an, on peut partir à l'église. My family were, they were believers, but I say that in parentheses. <laughs> that um, they went to church two times a year. <laughs> oui, ça, ça, notre église. Ça, je viens d'ici. And so that's the background that I came from. Uh, je continue, comment je connais Jésus? Tu, tu Do you want to know how I met Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> of, of course. Ouais. <laughs> yeah. Oui, je, comme je dis que j'étais 20, 20, combien, combien de minutes? J ai, j ai... How many minutes do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> he can talk a long time. But, <laughs> um, really, really, how many minutes do you want me to speak? <laughs> oh, uh, how about five? Is that good? Okay, yeah. good. Uh, moi, je, comme, comme j'ai un jeune que uh, 23 ans, je, vraiment, je veux l'argent pour, uh, pour vivre ma vie. I was a 23 year old man. I just wanted money to live with my life. Et pour uh, peut-être acheter un bateau un jour en Syrie. I thought about maybe buying a car in Syria, something like that. Et pour ça, je pensais vraiment en Syrie, on ne peut pas faire ça, je vais sortir le Lebanon. And so I thought, I can't really do that in Syria right now, so I'll just go to Lebanon. Je n'étais pas vraiment content, je dis, quand j'ai l'argent, que sera ton tour? I wasn't really happy in my life, and I just kept thinking, once I have money, I'll be happy. Et ça, c'est mon but que j'ai parti à Lebanon. So that was my goal, to go to Lebanon to make money. Et après, après que je suis sorti à Lebanon, euh, il, y a, il y a un jour que je suis parti à Lebanon, il était une personne qui m'a parlé de Jésus. But, after, but uh, before I went to Lebanon, there was someone who talked to me about Jesus. Et c est, c est, je dis oui, que c'est bien, je suis parti à l'église avec lui. So I said, okay, that's fine, I'll go to church with you one time. C'était une église évangéliste, bien sûr. And it was an evangelical church in Syria. Et elle m'a demandé de prier, demander Seigneur, je dis oui. And they asked him to pray and receive Jesus, and he was like, okay. Je demande vraiment, oui. So I prayed. Mais il n'est pas quelque chose changé. But nothing changed in my life. Mais, mais je sentais qu'ils sont cette gens dans l'église, ils sont quelque chose que je n'ai pas. But I felt like there were people in the church that had something that I didn't je have. C'est quoi Jésus, Saint Esprit, je connais rien I, de tout. I didn't know anything at all. I didn't know if it was Jesus, Holy Spirit, but there was something. Mais mais ils sont quelque chose. There was something. Et c'est quelque chose qui m'a touché. And that's what touched me. Il y a quelque chose ils sont que je que je n'ai pas. I felt like there was something they had that I didn't have. Yeah, alors, je sais pas quoi. But I didn't know what that was. Je dis, je dois but I thought, I need whatever that is. Quand les part... Quand je partais à Lebanon, so when I went to Lebanon, et je dis, vraiment, pourquoi je cherche pas ça ici? I thought, why not search for what I'm missing here in Lebanon too? Il y a un ami qui était vraiment euh, euh, méchant. I had a friend who had a really bad history. Et je vois lui qu'elle changeait. And I saw him and saw that he had changed. Il, était, il parle toujours à Jésus. And he talked all the time about Jesus. Et je dis, qu'est-ce qui se passe avec lui? And I thought, what has happened to you? Il dit, Jésus, il m'a changé. And he said, Jesus changed me. Et, et maintenant, il est pasteur en Suède. And now he is a pastor in Sweden. Uh, et uh, quand, quand je partis, je dis, ok, je vais partir avec toi. So I thought, okay, I want to go with you. Et bien sûr, moi, comme une personne, je, vous, je priais avec plusieurs personnes pour accepter ce mieux. And everywhere I went, I prayed with people to accept Jesus. <laughs> Always. Mais rien changé. But nothing changed. Uh, un jour que j'étais en, en Ticalo, à la radio. Uh, one day I was listening to a radio program there in Lebanon called Monte Carlo. Et c'est quelqu'un dit, uh, et je commençais à lire l'Évangile. Moi, ça c'est ton, je commençais à lire l'Évangile. I had started reading the Bible already. Avant trois ans, vingt, vingt trois ans, j'ai jamais je lis juste l'Évangile de Matthieu. And before this time in my life, I had only read the book of Matthew in my entire life. Et, et je, quand je commençais, j'arrivais à Matthieu 7. When I got to Matthew 7. Et cette personne, elle est en train de parler à Matthieu 7. This radio program was talking about Matthew chapter 7. Alors, c'était, je sentais que la parole, c'était pour moi. And I felt like this is the word of God for me. Et, et, et quand il dit comme ça, euh, c'est quelqu'un, elle demande son père, pain, elle va donner pain, elle va pardonner les pierres. 
when it says that if someone goes to his father and asks for bread, he's not going to give him a rock in return. Or if he asks for fish, he'll give him fish and not and, and you're bad and you still know how to give the good for your and, and how much more your father. And my dad was really bad. <laughs> Alors, c'était alcoolique. He was an alcoholic. Et je dis vraiment, jamais il a donné de pierre. And I thought, but he's never given me a rock. Ou toujours ramené le pain pour nous. And he has always given us bread. Et il a ramené le poisson pour he's nous. He's always given us fish. Je dis, alors, c'est père, il est fort, il est, il est, il est, il est à haut, qu'est-ce qu qu'il parle à haut. Elle va donner le bien. And I thought, my heavenly father, this father in heaven, he's going to give me even better. Et alors, pour ça, je dis, Seigneur, euh, et, et en Luc 11, il dit, And in Luke 11, it says, il dit, il a esprit qu'il va demander. And he will give the... La radio, avec les personnes qui l'ont prié. And so I prayed with the person who was praying at the same time on the radio. Et euh, je pensais qu'il va penser quelque, penser quelque chose ou... Je, je sais pas qu -ce que sera. I didn't know what would happen when I began to pray. Mais je dormir. But I slept well. <laughs> Deuxième jour. And so the second day. Je sentis l'autorité en moi. I felt the authority of Jesus in me. Et vraiment autorité. Real authority. Que je dis pour le péché non. Could, that I could say no to sin. Et je aime le, 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 les gens, tous les gens. And I love all kinds of people. Et quelque chose sont sainteté il sera. Uh, pour, pour moi. And Comme I felt something holy in me. Je, je, je pas penser à mal à les gens. I didn't want to think badly of other people. Et je compris ici que pris. And I understood at that moment that I really had what I was missing. Et j'ai appelé, appelé pour le jeune Hasake. Je dis, and I, on vient pour changer les villes. And I called the people from my hometown Hasake in Syria and said, I'm coming to change the city. <laughs> et, et, uh, vraiment, de ces gens ce, ce temps, euh, je n'ai pas, pas arrêté qu'évangéliste. And so from that moment, I haven't stopped the work of evangelist. Et, et maintenant aussi, on, on, a, on a un, un groupe aussi de prier de Hazaki aussi. Je vais euh, arriver plus ouais. tard. Okay. So I even continue to pray for my, my hometown here from Europe as well. Uh, oui, et là, elles sont plusieurs personnes. Quand je partais à Hazaki, plusieurs personnes ont changé et Dieu a donné son vie pour Jésus. And I, when I returned from Lebanon back to Syria, I saw that several people had given their lives to Jesus and et, it was beginning to change. Et après ça, 12 ans, je partais, je venais à Belgique. And then I came to Belgium a couple of years later. C'est fini cinq minutes. And that's my five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, I feel like I could spend an hour or two just on Hari's story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And when I come to Belgium, I want to hear the long version of the story. <laughs> Sit here at this table and we will talk. <laughs> yes, Welcome. yes. I look forward to that so much. Um, thank you, Hari. You, you have a beautiful story, one that I hope can be shouted from the rooftops um, because it, it's a life-changing story. And clearly um, your story is continuing to change lives. So we're so grateful that you're in Belgium, but that also you have this incredible connection um, with your home in Syria still as well. Mm. So, yeah. um, so I'm gonna switch over to Janae so she doesn't have to translate as much. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, and what a beautiful language. I mean, I've heard French before, but oh my goodness, you you do so good. And you, so Janae, real quick, you speak English, French, English. Dutch? Dutch, uh, enough, yeah. Enough, okay. And then are you dabbling yeah. in Arabic? <laughs> dabbling is a good word. Yeah, I can, and, and you know, the longer I'm in it, the more I understand, and I understand a lot of subjects. So I might be able to respond in a different language about the conversation that's happening, but Arabic is one of the hardest languages in the world to learn, and there's so many dialects, so um, I just do what I can. That's it. <laughs> hey, that's, that's awesome. We should all strive to learn and dabble in two or three different languages, let alone four. So, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it's you know so good to hear from Hari and you know his his own voice, um, his story. But Janae, what what is your background and how did you end up in Belgium? Well, I am from Illinois, so up north, and from a little farming community. It's called a village. 1,500, maybe not even 1,500 people, a tiny little place. Um, and I was the Protestant girl in a Catholic village and grew up in the local Baptist church in the t- neighboring town and only child. And I got into college and got into summer mission programs um, with my college Bible study and just really began to feel like this is where God was leading me. And so I was in college and got my bachelor's in music education. So I'm a teacher. And um, after college, I did a two year missionary program in Africa, in Zimbabwe and Botswana. Mm -hmm. And then um, came back to the United States and I went to seminary and got my MDiv in Texas. And from Texas, I uh, found out more about CBF and got involved with CBF from from the Texas office there that used to be there and um, applied to do mission work with CBF and went through the GSC program back in the day. This was in 2004 that I came here. So this is quite a few, 17 years ago. Um, And I came here to answer a request to teach English. So being a teacher, it seemed like a more natural fit. And it was in a Muslim neighborhood in Brussels. So the capital city of Belgium um, to work with Butch and Nell Green were serving in Brussels at that time. And so the idea was that I come here for three years and see where God leads. Um, Butch and Nell Green left after my second year here. So I was a year um, alone. I say that alone in in the country. And Hari and I met each other in church. Um, We were both going to the local Arabic church that spoke Arabic and French. And it was an easy fit because if I had an English student who wanted to learn more about Jesus, I could bring them to their people and learn about Jesus in their heart language, which is so important. And so Hari being the evangelist that he is was a great connector. And at that point, we didn't have a common language except for Jesus. So we just worked at putting people together and eventually came up with our version of French as a common language, because it's not great French, it's our version. And um, then we were married in 2008 and felt God moving us out of Brussels where there was the, it was the only place at that time that really had Arabic speaking ministry, um, evangelical or Protestant ministry. And so we looked at the map of Belgium and just prayed to see where God would want us to go. And in 2000, early 2011, so 10 years ago, we moved here to Antwerp and there was no um, Protestant work being done among Arabic speakers outside of the Brussels region. So we became church planters here in Antwerp. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Here we> <laughs> So you've been in in Belgium since 2004. So that is long-term presence. I mean, I know you've been back to the States several times, but um, that is a very long-term presence um, to be there. So so now you have two beautiful daughters, um, Phoebe and Maria Grace. And so you're raising a family in Antwerp, Belgium, What's, what is, what is it like to raise a family in Belgium? You're a missionary, your husband's from Syria, your daughters were born in Belgium. They were born in Belgium. Yeah, probably were different than um, a lot of other missionaries uh, because we use Belgium as our homeland now because I'm not Syrian and he's not American. So yes, our family has been established here in this country. The girls were both born here. Um, We have dual nationality, everyone in our family. So that gives the girls the right to be Belgian and they feel more Belgian than they feel anything else because they've spent the majority of their their lives here. And so Phoebe is 10 now, she's in the fourth grade and Maria Grace is six and she's in the first grade. Um, The Belgian school system starts children at two and a half years old in school. So they go through three years of preschool before they hit first grade, which Sounds overwhelming at first to put your two and a half year olds in full-time school, 
but it's great for language. Um, and we know that that is an advantage for our kids who have this mix of four languages in their home, that they can do their studies in Dutch. So when we were in Brussels, it was a French speaking area for us. And here in Antwerp, it's Dutch speaking. So it's the largest Dutch speaking city in the country. The country is small and very divided in language. So um, it's, it's a different world. We're about 30 miles, 40 miles apart from where we were before in the country, but it's almost as if we moved countries in the, the culture and the atmosphere of the city. It's a very international city. Um, I can get on a bus and hear 10 languages on a bus at one time being spoken. Uh, I remember the first day that Phoebe realized we were, we because the girls and I do public transportation all the time, and she realized I was the only woman who did not have a, a veil covering on my head. Um, just, we live in a densely populated area with um, Moroccan immigrants, Turkish immigrants, and then with the conflict and war in Syria and Iraq, there's a lot more refugees out of that area in the last five to six years. So that's where we chose to live. Um, and our girls go to school. And Hari is also, he works part-time as a welder so that he can do full-time ministry and have some family time as well out of that. So, so we are in the community working, going to school, involved in ministry, all of those aspects and doing our best to survive in a multilingual society. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. And then you throw COVID on top of it all. And, <laughs> and yeah, and now, right now you're stuck uh, kind of in the house uh, a lot, but I can only imagine what uh, kinds of things that has thrown at y'all over this last year as well. Um, but how much longer are y'all in, in lockdown for, do you know? Uh, the, we're in the second of three weeks where the girls have to stay home from school. Hari is still allowed to go to work, but the advice is to keep your children at home as, as much as possible right now. Um, so we're hoping that the government will decide that they can go back to school after this three week time period is up. So normally we have a two week Easter vacation. So they just added a week before Easter vacation onto our normal vacation time. That's a little bit easier to swallow than <laughs> the change, just adding an extra week. But, um, well, tell us, you know, you kind of mentioned it. What, what is the ministry that y'all are doing? What types of ministry are you doing? And, you know, what are the people that you're working with? Tell us kind of about your work and what you're doing, you and Hari. Well, when we came here in 2011, it was just a heart to start ministry and church ministry among the Arabic speaking population because there was nothing consistently being done. And so we moved here in, gosh, I think we moved here in February and by March we had a Bible study started and it, um, and just there was a place that allowed us to meet and gather weekly. And we started with a small Bible study of five people that grew into a church plant. Um, but specifically Hari's heart, our heart together is for people coming out of Islam. And sometimes that doesn't mix as well together with people who have a background from maybe Catholic Orthodox, which is mostly what Christian people have come out of in the Middle Eastern region. And so sometimes that doesn't work well together because of the insecurities or persecution that happened in their land between those two groups. And so we left that ministry a few years ago to, in the hands of um, some other Syrian leaders so they continue to do that so that we could focus a bit more on those coming out of Islam. And so we started our second church plant a little over two years ago, I think, um, here so that we could focus on that group so that those who join that group, maybe they also came from a Christian background, but they are aware and welcoming towards those who are coming out of Islam because that takes a special kind of discipleship and community building um, than it does for those who have a similar background. And so that is, that's our heart. So we started a church service, Bible studies, prayer meetings, what probably a lot like what you think of church activities, smaller scale. Um, churches are small in general in Belgium. Uh, evangelical uh, Protestant churches are, the numbers are hard to say because they don't do religious research in Belgium, but somewhere around 1% or less of the, of the population is 
evangelical or Protestant Christianity. So it's a very small minority. And so, um, so we do everything, probably what you're thinking of, but just in a smaller, very much smaller scale. 60 people is a big church for us, um, including our children. And so we also work alongside other organizations or um, just groups here. There's a, a ministry group here run by a Belgian woman who ministers to red light district women or homeless women. And so sometimes we partner where we can help there. If it's a place, a bed for a woman to sleep in or connecting people together who have a heart for that ministry. Um, Hari partners often with a, a organization called Koinonia that works with more of the homeless population or the low income population in doing ministry at Christmas called a greatest gifts festival. And this week he participated in an Easter time where they just gave away free items that people need for their household that might be harder to get by, especially during COVID time where jobs are not as consistent. So we partner in those ways as well. And then with refugees coming in, we know that sometimes they need help, especially with language, because language is just hard here. Um, and when you're, you're thinking about an Arabic speaking person is coming from a whole different alphabet to learn the Dutch language. And so it becomes really complicated for a lot of people. So sometimes like Hari might be looking for an apartment for someone or I'm going to a doctor's appointment or the doctors have my email address to communicate how we can translate through three people to get the right information to the right patient or through the social system that helps them to get established. So we're often a contact of being in between the system whatever that looks like and the person or setting up electricity. So doing really practical helps here is often something that just fills our day as well. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like y'all do such beautiful work of hospitality. I mean, you know, in all different kinds of ways, but that, that you and Hari are um, really just kind of on the front lines of welcoming and then assisting in that that type of ministry, which, you know, we're all called to as Christians, that, that ministry of hospitality and creating the beloved community. Um, but are there any, do you have any um, specific ministry projects that you would want to want us to know about that you're working on? Well, this year, especially during the whole new way that we do COVID life with Zoom and connecting in such different ways, um, we have been able to do Bible study and worship projects that have Arabic speakers, not just from Belgium, but they go, maybe they're still in Syria or in the Netherlands and Sweden. And so it's been a, a wonderful thing to see the community grow. So those are projects that happen, Bible studies, um, but with ministers from different countries. So, so it feels uh, more unified. And so that's a, a really great thing that we would like to see continue even after, even after the hope of normal life coming back. <laughs> um, but also through all the Zoom meetings and stuff, Hari touched on it. It's, he is able to, to connect people from his area of Syria or all over Syria. We see the church, the Syrian church is scattered all throughout the world because of the war that's happened over the last 10 years. And so those people are having this heart cultivated in them to go back in, in some way, shape or form into Syria because the church has dried up during the last 10 years of war. Um, the people who were wealthy enough could get out or had some kind of avenue to get out. So what's left feels like dry bones right now. And so the Syrians who are outside are feeling God just tug on their hearts to pour back in to those who are still there in this dry and very thirsty land. And so with the help of some partners in the Netherlands, we've started what's called the Mustard Seed Project. And this allows, one of the first steps is that every Saturday, a group from Syria get together on Zoom, whether they're still in Syria or not, and they pray. And then the Mustard Seed Project is focused on supporting missionaries in Syria, because what you can do with 200 euro in Syria can help a family do ministry for a month, because the cost of living is so much different than what it would be here in Europe. And so 
Um, we have also seen a, a couple who got out of Syria, moved to Sweden, got their paperwork in Sweden, lived there for years, felt the call of God on their heart to go back into Syria and minister. So we're seeing Syrians being called back to their land, which is a beautiful thing. And, and you just think of the sacrifice if they had an established life and they're going back into poverty and war to see the, the hand of God work among those who are still there. So we pour in um, prayer and resources into things like making sure kids have cookies for kids clubs in Syria. Um, buying a church van that can go and get those kids around the rubble of war and, and everything that's happened and bring them to church. And so every once in a while, we'll get a video out just to see what's happening in Syria. And so it's a beautiful thing to see how COVID seems dividing in so many ways. And yet for us, we've seen it unify the body of Christ among Arabic speakers and especially among Syrians. And so that's a really special project in our hearts right now, um, just supporting and providing for ministry to happen in, in the homeland of Syria for us. Um, so that's, and then of course, what I just said, things like the, the organization that we work with here um, providing for Christmas and Easter to bring life to those who are needy here in Antwerp as well. But we see that when, we, I mean, it's just like when you come along and encourage us, we see what it does to the church in America. And for us here in Europe and among Arabic speakers to encourage the church in Syria, what it does to those who are outside of Syria as well. And so we just keep that process continuing all over the world. And so it's a beautiful thing for us to see. Absolutely. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about the um, house that you guys bought um, that you're trying <laughs> so hard to uh, turn into a, a church house, right? Is that, <clears throat> can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, we felt the Lord leading us to buy a ministry house that could be used for Arabic ministry 24-7. And so a couple of years ago, God provided for us to buy that house. And at that moment, um, we found out that there were all kinds of legal complications that turn out to be religious persecution through paperwork um, towards all kinds, all religious groups. Um, here in Antwerp, we are we are grouped together as houses of prayer, whether we're Christian or Muslim or Jewish, we're all in the same, same um, situation. And so right now we are one of 30 groups of worship that's being targeted and being said that our paperwork is out of order, um, all kinds of things against us from the city. And as we have gotten in contact with religious persecution lawyers, um, they have said that is exactly what the city of Antwerp is doing. They're coming against religious groups in order to control their ideas, control God is what they have said. So we are, we, I have been in a two year um, paperwork battle with the city. We have been able to use the building for the two years until just recently. And the city said, um, you're going to have to put a stop on it until everything comes out in order. So that is a huge prayer request in our lives is that um, we're working with people to regulate paperwork and, and we just need someone to say, they've been at this so long. We, we are the widow. He keeps coming before the judge and we just need the judge to say, okay, fine, you can have it. <laughs> um, and just to give us permission to be able to use that building the way um, we believe that it needs to be used or for God to give us direction on how he wants us to use that building to the best of his glory. And so we're willing to change up, be creative about the way we think through things and the use of it. But um, we know that we are in the middle of a story. And so we don't know how this one's going to end, um, but we are praying our way through the story to see what God wants to happen in all of it. Absolutely. We will definitely be joining you in that prayer. Oh, thank you. You know, how 
from, you know, we're Ardmore Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And so one of the questions is, you know, how is it that we can come alongside you and support you personally um, and in the work that you do? You know, what are, what are the different ways that we can encourage you? Well, it's a beautiful thing for us to know that people are praying for us. Um, Cause sometimes we live in a, we live in a world where um, we live in a very heavily Islamic world in the middle of Europe. Um, we, we feel like we're an island sometimes. Um, like Ellen said, you know, we're not close by CBF personnel or, you know, we're working with brothers and sisters in Christ here in Antwerp, but we love that encouragement of knowing that somebody is lifting us up by name even if they don't know all the details of what we're walking through today, to just know that they know our names. Somebody knows our names and is praying for us. And we believe that prayer can change everything and that, that God is working through our prayers um, and that it's a blessing when we see that he answers the prayers for the prayer and the one who's on the receiving end, we all get blessed out of it. And so we are encouraged greatly by prayer as our number one need every day. Um, also I've thought about that, just the connection with our kids, because I've said they feel more Belgian than they are American or Syrian. Um, but there's those times where America seems super exciting to them <laughs> because it's that vacation destination for them. <laughs> um, but somehow that connection or, you know, on mission teams, sometimes the population of MKs change so much that just knowing that somebody thinks about them, they're, they're constantly amazed. If we get a package that's not from their grandma, they're just like, somebody thought about us? How, how is that, that someone thought of us? So just that, that connection with our kids to kids their own age to know that hopefully when the COVID time bans allow us to travel again, that we can come and see you and, and that they can connect with kids their own age in your church and make new friends that they remember, they remember children for so long after they've met them and they remember the next visit. Oh, can we go back and see them at their house or their church? And so that's important from the mama heart. It's just important to know that they're connected in a greater way as well. Um, and then of course visits, because it's encouraging for us to be able to walk with someone else through our city and say, you know, those things that we've been telling you about, it's right over there. Or <laughs> let me show you this refugee in person and let me let her tell you her story. Um, those kinds of things are super precious to us and also to the people we minister to here because I'm the American they meet. So when you come, <laughs> You're the other Americans and they will remember you for so long as well. Um, and of course, Ellen talked about like the financial connections um, and the offering for global missions, but also just the way you support us in the ministry so that we can continue doing Bible studies and prayer meetings and meeting the needs of refugees who just maybe didn't have enough money to make it this month or had a special need on their hearts that we we're able to help them with. And, and so all of those ways are just connecting for us and a blessing to us. Absolutely. Hearing you talk about your daughters, that just takes me back to my own childhood <laughs> and being a missionary kid at heart and uh, just remembering those things. I, I really look forward to connecting with your girls um, over their story um, and, and their life. But, um, you know, as we start to kind of wrap this up, one of our mission team members, you know, we've talked about how to tell the world that we are in a relationship with Janae and Hari and Phoebe and Maria Grace. And um, one of our people on our missions team, his name is Chester, and he put it so beautifully. He said, we just want everybody to fall in love with this family. And I think that mm -hmm. that is just, <laughs> I, that is the that is exactly what we wanted for this interview today. And I even just talked, I've talked to you several times already, but even just through this conversation, 
I already feel a tremendous connection um, with you and your family. And we are so excited to be able to enter into this um, covenant with you. Um, so those of you watching this interview, um, I hope that you will uh, join us um, on Sunday, May 16th, um, which is, you know, just a little over a month away. Um, in both of our worship services, we are going to be um, formalizing our covenant um, with Janae and Hari, and um, we'll be signing it uh, live. We're going to zoom in uh, their family from Belgium. It won't be too late there um, quite yet, uh, even though they're six hours ahead. Um, but they're going to be there, um, and we're going to be welcoming uh, Mary Kaler from CBF North Carolina, um, as Ellen uh, isn't quite able to travel yet um, for her duties due to the COVID stuff, um, but Ellen will definitely be there with us in spirit. Um, and so, Ellen, we want to thank you for your partnership on this um, and letting us ask you a thousand questions um, and really just helping us down this road. Uh, Janae, thank you, and thank you to Hari and the patience of your girls uh, for joining with us in this conversation today. Um, we hope uh, that uh, those watching will join us on Sunday, May 16th, um, but before we go, um, I'm going to close this out in a word of prayer, so join me if you will. Dear God, we are so grateful for modern technology and that you have connected people over technology from North Carolina to Belgium. And God, we are so grateful that you have put us together in this relationship. God, that you have been a part of this process for our church and a part of the lives and work of Janae and Hari and their girls. God, we praise you for the work that they are doing in Belgium, for their willingness to continue to answer the call that you have put on their lives every single day. God, we pray that as uh, we enter into this relationship together, that you help it to thrive, that you find ways for us to grow together, that you find ways, God, through this relationship to grow the kingdom. God, we specifically pray that you have your loving arms around Janae and Hari and Phoebe and Maria Grace as they live and work in Belgium, God, that you protect them, that you offer more blessings than can be counted. God, that they would be affirmed and encouraged through the hard work that is before them. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray all of these things. Amen. Thank y'all so much for joining us. Um, and if you have questions about this or you want to get to know Ellen or Janae uh, better, we will um, have their contact information in the comments below. So feel free uh, to reach out to them, but always to me as well, Amy Gallagher. Um, and I will also list my contact information. Thank y'all so much and have a great rest of the day.